Uh, so it, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, uh, Monica Kolpi uh, uh, in this uh, to this audience here. Uh, Professor Kolpi, uh, 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 you know, received uh, her PhD in physics uh, from University of Milano in 1987. Um, and after a couple of uh, postdoc positions uh, at Cornell University and CISA uh, in Trieste, uh, she joined as a uh, faculty. She joined as a faculty in University of Milano uh, in 1990, and then uh, she uh, moved to uh, uh, University of Milano uh, Bicocca in 2001, uh, where she uh, works uh, at present uh, as a full professor. Uh, she has uh, over 180 uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications uh, with more than, uh, I think, 130,000 citations. Uh, she is a uh, member of uh, numerous uh, science uh, boards, including uh, Einstein Telescope uh, Observational Science Board, um, uh, Virgo, uh, uh, Virgo uh, Science Board, uh, of INFN um, and uh, National Institute of Astrophysics, uh, National Institute of uh, uh, Nuclear Physics. Uh, she has uh, served as a chair of uh, uh, the Astrophysical uh, Black Holes uh, Working Group from 2012 to uh, 2018. And she was the vice president of uh, Scientific INAF Scientific Council um, uh, of uh, uh, um, from 2016 to 2020. Uh, she is a member of Space Science Advisory Committee. Uh, she was uh, uh, she is a member of 3D Science Case Committee, and so on. Uh, there are a long list of uh, the achievements. Uh, I, I wouldn't go into all those details. Uh, she has. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of work uh, in the area of astrophysics. Without further ado, I would welcome Professor Kolpi to deliver the first lecture in this series. Professor Kolpi. Thanks, Chandra. Thanks, Chandra. Namaste. Namaste. And uh, good morning to all the students in India. It is really a pleasure to be with you, though I'm sad that I'm not in Madras. And I just visited India only once in my life. I visited Rajasthan, and uh, I think it is an enchanting place, and uh, I would really enjoy. So let's hope that after the pandemic, uh, I, can, I can visit you, and you can visit uh, me in, in Milano. The spirit of uh, these uh, three lectures is just to deliver to you the beauty of what we know about what we might call the astrophysical black holes that we see both now in the electromagnetic and in the gravitational universe. Uh, in the next decades, there will be a revolution because uh, we are going to explore our universe by detecting by sensing the gravitational waves emitted uh, in extreme environments. And uh, that would uh, really lead to a breakthrough in fundamental physics, uh, cosmology, and astrophysics. My touch is more on astrophysics, though I will also try to motivate why it is important in physics and cosmology not in this lecture, but in the following ones. Um, I don't know why I cannot proceed. OK, so this is the outline. I really uh, think it is important for you and for all of us to set the stage. That is, uh, give you a cosmological perspective of what is our universe, both in electromagnetic radiation and gravitational radiation. Then I will shortly uh, go through the properties of black holes when they are in binaries, 
because they become the loudest sources of gravitational waves in the universe we know today. They are really the loudest. Uh, then uh, I will go through uh, presenting to you the gravitational wave landscape and its prospected sources to move on to uh, the really the content of the first lecture, which is about uh, stellar compact objects. So stars, uh, so objects that have masses around a few to a several solar masses. I will mention what we knew before the discovery of the first gravitational wave source, GW150914, which is hosting two coalescing massive stellar black holes. And I will give you a light highlight of the LIGO discovery and some insight I hope on the formation mechanism on binary black holes. If not today, I will continue tomorrow. Um, because uh, it is important to know how these form, also to know how uh, the link that I will discuss in the Lex Nature that there might be between the stellar origin black holes and the supermassive black holes. Black holes, I think that since most of you have a theoretical background, I think you have appreciated in the previous lectures how beautiful are black holes in mathematical terms. They are pure geometrical objects. They are warping the space time and they are surrounded or the mass is inside the so-called event horizon, a spherical surface where the warping of space time is such, is so intense that not even light can emerge. But again, from the physical, say, or mathematical point of view, black holes uh, can exist uh, over a immense mass scale. Uh, just uh, avoiding a uh, problem with the matching with, with quantum mechanics, uh, so above the Planck mass, and if we also account for Hawking evaporation, as an astrophysicist, uh, we might consider the possibility that black holes carry the mass of an asteroid or a moon or a planet. If the Earth would become a black hole, it would have a Schwarzschild, a gravitational radius uh, that it is uh, of only uh, uh, one centimeter around, so Earth in a spoon or in a sugar spoon, but uh, we believe that uh, black holes uh, of stellar mass uh, are filling uh, the sources, our sources in the universe, as well the supermassive black holes of 10 to the 6 up to a few billion solar masses, these supermassive black holes have a, an horizon which has typically the size of our solar system. So you imagine that you have a billion solar masses, which is uh, so the, the, the mass that has uh, uh, an average galaxy in the universe confined in the region of the solar system. And if I'm considering a stellar mass black hole, it has a radius of say 30 to 100 kilometers. We will also be very much interested in discovering what we call the intermediate mass black hole of a 1000 solar masses of several hundred, do they exist? Well, we have hints that black holes are existing. And they are uh, elements of our universe. And uh, let me just set the stage and remind that all the physics we are discussing about black hole has to be uh, considered within the uh, cosmological framework. So forgive me the simplicity, but let me just remind you that 
after centuries of observations uh, uh, using electromagnetic uh, radiation as messenger, we know that the universe is emerging from a singularity that is a, con a physical condition uh, that we describe in quantum physics and uh, in, 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 a, in an unknown theory of quantum gravity. And our closest view of the uh, infant universe in reality comes from by looking at the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, the time when electrons are recombining onto the nuclei of hydrogen and helium uh, that are the only two elements that have experienced, that has been processed through uh, uh, primordial nucleosynthesis. Since that time, the uh, radiation field that was dominating the early stages of the infant universe is released and uh, is free uh, is, 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 is freely uh, uh, traveling across the universe. And we know that uh, after recombination that occurred 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, the dark matter density fluctuations that we see imprinted in uh, uh, the temperature anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation have time to grow nonlinear. And the, we know that during this epoch, uh, uh, we expect that the universe is going to be filled by what we call the dark matter halos. And uh, baryons that constitutes only 5% uh, of, of the dark matter content are falling into this local uh, uh, potential well. And so that we believe that the first stars are forming, we believe, we, we would like to know, but are forming around redshift 20 when the universe is only 100 million years old. The first stars that we call metal free, because in my language, the gas that is primeval is metal free because metal are all elements beyond helium that we know are synthesized through stellar nucleosynthesis, through stellar processes through supernova explosions. Dark uh, matter halos are growing in mass by merging and by accreting dark matter and uh, 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 along the cosmic filament of the web. And so again, we believe that the first galaxies, we already have evidence that they are present uh, around redshift. Uh, 11. And we call this age cosmic dawn because now the first structures, the first light beside the primeval light of the Big Bang is filling our universe. Many stars have UV spectra if they are massive. And if there are black holes, uh, we are witnessing a transition a phase transition, which is known as cosmic reionization, because the gas that during the dark ages, the gas that it is inter, in inter intra galaxies was neutral, now makes a transition to be fully ionized by uh, sources of UV radiation. And at the same time, and this is occurring uh, at an age of 600 billion years. Then uh, we are witnessing the assembly of galaxies that are growing, stars are forming. And uh, uh, here uh, at Redshift 2, uh, we have through Hubble observations, uh, we know that there is the peak of the star formation rate. So more than 50% or the bulk of the, of the stars uh, 
And so the galaxies are forming when the universe is already pretty old, 3.3 billion years. The universe today has 13.8 billion years and the universe uh, we live today, we know is housing hundred of uh, uh, thousand, uh, so 10 to 1000 billion uh, galaxies. So it is really filled of galaxies and is also undergoing an, an unexpected acceleration concerning the large scale structure. So the uh, universe expansion. Um, the electromagnetic unit in this uh, uh, three ages, the cosmic dawn, the cosmic reunization, the high noon and the today universe, as uh, I told you, we already have evidence of the existence of uh, a black hole, or we need to uh, um, in, uh, call for their presence because we have evidence. So we have observed the one of the most uh, uh, powerful transient that are called the long gamma ray burst. These are probably, you know, flashes of gamma uh, rays uh, that are believed to emerge from a jet launched by a massive black, a stellar black hole coming from the most massive stars. So we, we know that stars are in place at redshift nine. We don't know when star formation started. The first galaxies, the very massive ones and very morphologically uh, disturbed and irregular are seen at redshift 11.41 giga years. And we believe that the cosmic reionization of the inter, uh, uh, intergalactic medium is due to the presence now proved of uh, powerful quasars that are uh, emitting huge broadband luminosities and in particular in UV, the photons that can ionize hydrogen and that we believe are powered by accretion onto supermassive black holes. So already in, during cosmic dawn and cosmic ionization, we need to explain sources in terms of an engine, which has to be a black hole. What is it the interesting is that when we have the peak of the star formation rate and the peak of the assembly of galaxy, we see all over spread in 1% of the galaxy and nuclear activity, which we call AGN nuclear activity, which again uh, requires gas uh, feeding a supermassive black hole and it is synchronous. So black hole seems to uh, the supermassive one grow hand in hand with the galaxy. Now we are entering in a choir quieter stage, star formation and age and activity are declining because we have consumed a sizable fraction of the baryonic gas, which is feeding the AGN and forming star. But in almost every galaxy of the today universe, we see a candidate supermassive black hole. I say candidate because observation can't tell exactly that the engine is a black hole and a black hole as described by general relativity, but something that has a very intense uh, gra uh, gravity in order to, uh, uh, to let the gas outshine. And also in our own galaxy, we see many X-ray binaries uh, that are, uh, interpreted as being uh, candidate stellar black holes and neutron stars that are accreting material from a donor star. This is the electromagnetic universe, but how the universe 
would appear if, uh, uh, oh, oh, well, so in this, in this uh, slide, sorry, I'm just uh, summarizing what I said. So we have evidence also in our galactic center, I will talk about this in the next lectures, that the black holes or the candidate black hole are existing. So they encompasses, they encompass a huge mass scale, at least from 10 solar masses up to 10 to the nine solar masses, nine order of magnitudes in, in mass scale. They encompass different cosmic length state, and we would like really to prove their existence. So black hole existed before the rise of the nascent gravitational wave astronomy uh, are uh, necessary. And so that we can call, we can say our theory uh, required the existence of black holes as a paradigm. But now we want to turn a paradigm into a quantitative objective observation. And uh, uh, general relativity uh, is so powerful that it's telling us that when you have two black holes very, very close, so when their separations uh, are uh, several times uh, their horizons, they become very powerful sources of gravitational radiation. And just in a nutshell, let me just repeat what you should never forget when you learn and, and uh, open a paper that uh, is describing the discovery of a gravitational wave source. To leading order, uh, when, when you have a circular binary at a separation A and total mass M1, M given by the sum M1 plus M2, then the uh, frequency of the gravitational wave is just twice the Keplerian frequency because the emission comes from the time varying quadrupole moment. And uh, when the horizons are touching and the horizon is scaling as gm over c square, the frequency rises up to a costing value, which is just uh, c over the size of uh, the event horizon. And so uh, uh, two stellar origin black holes at the maximum frequency, uh, the, the maximum peak at, at the, of the emission is uh, around 100 hertz. But if you have instead a binary of 10 to the six solar masses, the costing frequency is instead 10 to the six times smaller. So it is in the millihertz band. Uh, here I'm showing the typical uh, um, uh, waveform that is the typical perturbation of the space time that I'm going to describe in a moment. So the oscillation of uh, uh, so the gravitational wave are, are uh, vibration of the space time. And here I'm showing the combined oscillation of the two polarization modes. And you see that the frequency is rising because the separation of the two black holes is decreasing. And this is called chirp because it is accompanied by an increase in the frequency. This is described as you have shown, seen in post-Newtonian theory. Then numerical relativity is used to describe the merger because you can't use any more analytical tools. The velocity, relative velocity of the two black holes is approaching the speed of light. And then when the two black holes are merging, use perturbation theory. 
And uh, for a long time, uh, it was a mystery how would the waveform appear during the merger and uh, Kip Thorne was the leading scientist to trying to understand whether given this knowledge, an interferometer could detect this way. Let me just give you two numbers that you never should forget, that we, when you have two black holes that are merging, the energy that is carried away in gravitational waves is in general, uh, let's say uh, 0.08, uh, the uh, reduced mass of the system because nu mc square, uh, nu is the so-called symmetric mass ratio, um, is just uh, nu mc square, nu m is the reduced mass of the system. So for equal mass binary, this is one fourth. And so a sizable fraction of the rest mass is released in gravitational waves. And it depends on the mass. So it is clear that if you have two black holes of 10 to the nine solar masses in the universe you release, 10 to the uh, eight solar masses C square in gravitational waves. So a huge, huge uh, amount of gravitational waves and, and citing uh, Cliff Will said zillions of zillions of zillions of uh, uh, gravitons if the graviton is describing the quantum state of a, a classical uh, gravitational wave. But what is also important to remind that the luminosity is independent on the mass because it is energy over time and energy and over time have the same scaling with the mass in G equals C equal one, uh, one units in, in, in dimensionless units. And so if all binaries, regardless the mass, when they merge at merger, there is a flash of luminosity, which is huge. Uh, as proved by the observation by LIGO, it was 10 to the 56 per second, which is far, far larger than the luminosity emitted by the all galaxies in the universe, with the exception that it is lasting only for a very short time. Um, Professor Colpi? Yes? Uh, there, was a, there was a remark in the chat about this new definition that denominator should have the m square. The denominator? The, the new definition, the, there should be a m square. Uh, Where? The symmetric uh, mass ratio. Oh, yes, the m square. Sorry, sorry. Of course. Sorry, it was a, my mistake. You probably also know that uh, one of the most, uh, uh, the first parameter which is measured is the so-called chirp mass, which is a combination between the reduced mass and the total mass of the system, which is measured by the rate of change of the frequency of the gravitational wave. Today, the sources we have detected are nearby, but with Einstein telescope and LISA, we are going to uh, detect uh, uh, sources that are at cosmological distances and gravitational waves, let me remind you, that suffer uh, only the expansion of the universe. And so uh, uh, they are uh, straight, uh, stretched by the expansion. And so uh, the frequency decreases as one over uh, plus t, as also radiation does. And uh, uh, also the shear mass is affected by uh, the same change because uh, again, the mass uh, is related uh, to the size and the size is related to the frequency that uh, is emitted. And here, I think it is familiar, but it is very important. This is the information uh, that a detector uh, which is able to disentangle the two independent polarization state can measure. A detector is measuring 
the combination, the sum of the plus polarization state plus the, plus the cross, uh, the cross polarization state. Let me just uh, comment uh, um, shortly. Uh, first of all, you have to notice that uh, uh, the wave uh, is declining with the, uh, the inverse of the luminosity distance, whereas the flux in electromagnetic radiation, which is detected, is decreasing as the square, uh, as one over d square. And so this is why um, gravitational waves can be seen out to very large rest redshift because they are declining with a, a, a smaller slope compared to radiation. So we have in principle, depending on the sensitivity of our detector, the possibility of having the access to the entire universe, as I also will show in my uh, uh, lectures. It uh, is uh, um, depending the uh, magnitude by the uh, angle yota between the angular momentum uh, of the binary and the line of sight. And uh, when we are seeing face on a binary, we are getting both H plus and H cross. So we try to uh, sort of uh, uh, select uh, uh, at the beginning the uh, binaries that are most likely to be face on oriented because we lose half of the SNR for an edge on binary. Uh, if we measure the independently the two polarization state, we can break the degeneracy between the luminosity distance and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the orientation, uh, the, uh, the inclination angle, yota, so that we can uh, learn about uh, the phase of the wave, which contains all the information we would like to know. The mass ratio, that is the individual masses, and uh, uh, the spins, how the spins are coupling, and uh, uh, with the angular momentum. And also, if you are talking about uh, uh, objects that are not point-like, in particular neutron stars, there is also information on the tidal deformability. And so, how uh, deformable are the star before they merge. Okay, so with this binary, we can sort of learn something that it is extremely difficult to learn from electromagnetic observation of a black hole. We can learn about the masses, we can learn about the spin, which is a fundamental parameter, especially if we want to prove the no-hair theorem, uh, we can uh, see if really they are described by the Kerr metric by looking at the multiple multipolar structure, which is imprinted in, uh, especially in the ring down phase, as you probably learned. So we, and uh, we might also detect uh, their position in the sky, and identify the host galaxy and do astrophysics. So uh, this single source contain, which is described by 17 parameters that has been to be extracted by this uh, waveform. So it is a challenge in terms of parameter estimation that has to be carried on with extreme care and requires priors in uh, the uh, definition of the sources, but uh, of the astrophysical sources, but it is these are measurements that uh, are uh, precise and are unique of this new emerging uh, gravitational universe. So the expectations are that, as I will show, that we can discover massive black hole colliding in galaxies, growing black hole during cosmic dawn, uh, 
uh, seeing the relic of the first stars, and why not? Also a primordial uh, mm, uh, cosmological uh, background from the early universe, not associated to inflation, but to other physical processes, plus astrophysical foreground. So we will learn, we have a completely different view of uh, the universe. So we often in public lectures, we are just saying, we are going to add to the uh, light, to the, to, to, the, to the picture we have, the sound, and so we make a movie of the universe. Uh, you have then understood that uh, gravitational wave only confining to binaries uh, is intrinsically a multi-band uh, 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 universe. Indeed, uh, mm, the uh, spectrum of the gravitational wave universe can extend from, say, if I'm using the frequency as reference to 10 to the three hertz or several 10 to the three hertz, which correspond to periodicities around a millisecond or less. And uh, uh, besides the binary black holes that LIGO and Virgo have detected, we expect uh, signals at the time of a supernova explosion and also signal from oscillating pulsars uh, if they uh, carry uh, even tight deformability. These two uh, signals has not been detected yet. And in particular, we know that neutron stars are really round, round, round stars because the ellipticity, so the deviation from sphericity is now uh, measured down to a limiting value, which has to be less than uh, one part in 10 to the 11. Uh, if we move to lower frequencies, uh, uh, and let me also remind you that the range between say 10 Hertz to a few thousand Hertz is the one brought by terrestrial interferometers like LIGO, uh, Hanford and Livingston, like Virgo, Kagra, the cryogenic uh, uh, Japan uh, interferometer that is now joining the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. But let me remind you, and we will be talking the third generation of gravitational uh, inter, uh, terrestrial interferometers like Einstein Telescope and Cosmic Explorer will let us see the entire universe. Then if we move to the band, which is corresponding to uh, frequencies uh, of around a millihertz corresponding to hours and minutes, we will be detecting the signal from coalescing, coalescing black hole of 10 to the six solar masses, that is black holes as the one which is in the midst of our Milky Way and the so-called extreme mass ratio that I will describe next lectures. And then there is an ongoing uh, activity of searching um, the foreground uh, emitted by a, a population of supermassive black holes of billion solar masses in their in spiral phase, still far from merger, say even centuries from merger, okay, uh, that can produce a foreground that uh, radio uh, pulsars, uh, since our perfect clocks, uh, can detect through uh, uh, the correlation in the signal in the arrival times uh, on Earth that could really unveil on parsec scale such a um, spec uh, background. And we are just in the verge of discovering this. Then if we go to, to very long uh, 
uh, wavelengths, uh, we are just approaching uh, the Big Bang and maybe uh, light bird and uh, the study of the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation will let us know about uh, uh, gravitational wave emitted during inflation. I'm not an expert on uh, cosmological uh, uh, sources, uh, uh, background, but the, in general, they are broadband. So they could be in all bands, also in space-based interferometers that are uh, the ones that can detect the frequencies at millihertz, and this is LISA. Okay, so uh, just to let you know uh, the power of this uh, uh, gravitational universe, uh, which will lead to a, a new renaissance, we will be proving uh, gravity in extreme and highly dynamical space uh, uh, regimes never uh, discovered before. Uh, we will explore different cosmic landscapes we will unveil the nature of neutron stars, though the topic is black hole, I would like to mention shortly neutron stars. We will unveil the nature of all the engine that need uh, to power gamma ray burst and active galactic nuclei. And uh, we have a complementary view of our evolving universe, carrying precision test of general relativity, measuring the Hubble flow and discovering the unknown. Before the birth of the gravitational wave astronomy, we knew the existence uh, on stellar scales of neutron stars and stellar origin black holes. Uh, Professor Kolsky? Yes? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, maybe this is a, a good point to ask uh, uh, the participants, if they have any questions so far. Uh, so uh, panelists, uh, participants, uh, if you have any uh, questions, maybe this is a good time to ask. Uh, uh, you can log your questions in the Q&A using the Q&A button or raise your hands. Okay, uh, if not, I had a had a question. Uh, uh, can you? Okay, so I think uh, uh, okay. I think there was a there was something in the. Um, Okay, I, I had a had a question. Uh, okay, let me just uh, see. There was a chat. There was a question on the ellipticity of the neutron stars. Okay, let me just allow one. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I have allowed. Can you ask your question, Aditya? Yeah, thanks. So it was uh, regarding what you pointed out about, about the ellipticity of the neutron stars. And you said it is constrained to be smaller than one part in 10 to the power 11. Can you yeah. uh, can you uh, like uh, can you highlight that remark? Like, is it for very old neutron stars, or is it for neutron stars in general? Because it is concerning something that I'm working on. So, uh, uh, well, I'm I'm I, I I was planning to talk this tomorrow, uh, and because also I want to go back to to the last paper of the Virgo collaboration, but. Um, uh, uh, I th I think it is uh, it is coming. Uh, so let let me answer, and I will check. Certainly, for the old neutron stars, you expect more round because uh, uh, because in the millisecond pulsar the magnetic field is so low, there are no glitches that are very stable, and so you would expect uh, a much lower level of ellipticity. But for crab or for very young pulsars, the limit might be 10 to the minus 8, because there you would expect instead that there are little mountains uh, of millimeter size. And, uh, and you, uh, but still uh, the constraints are very, are very, so there is no 
yet any measurement uh, of a, a gravitational signal coming from, from uh, uh, deformed uh, pulsars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. Uh, so you know the indirect uh, evidence of gravitational wave emission came with the discovery uh, by Halsen Taylor, and this was indeed the motivation for uh, uh, the Virgo people and the LIGO people to uh, to uh, push the sensitivity limits in order to detect the coalescence of two neutron stars because. We knew they're in place. We have uh, about a dozen in the Milky Way. We know for them that the coalescence time is several million years, and they are rare. So we had to go at least to the Virgo cluster. This is why Virgo is called, or to go to 100 megaparsec scale to hope to see uh, the merging of two neutron stars and also to prove the association to the short, short gamma ray burst. So the discovery of the double neutron star system in the Milky Way has been the, the strong motivation to discover not only the wave per se that would directly, that would be, would have been groundbreaking, but also to, uh, to, to associate this to the to, to, to the gamma ray bursts. So that was certainly uh, very important. Then uh, uh, we knew of the existence of stellar black hole candidates in, uh, in uh, accreting uh, X-ray sources. Uh, and uh, they were established to be black holes because it was possible in binaries to have an approximate measure of the mass that was exceeding the maximum mass of a neutron star. And, uh, but nobody was expecting uh, that the first source of gravitational wave was uh, the coalescence of two stellar black holes because also they were invisible otherwise. So there were no evidence. No evidence as well of the existence of a pair of neutron star plus a black hole. But this was the motivation to really go uh, into uh, uh, detecting this, and in particular to learn about neutron stars that are the densest and smallest star in, in the universe. They carry an hard surface, typically of 10 to 15 kilometers. And when you smash two neutron stars, you only hope to see uh, so the content of the uh, crust, so where you have nuclei, electrons and neutrons, but from the deformability uh, that is imprinted in the phase of the waveform, you might infer indirectly whether there is a, uh, inside a, a quark hadron phase transition. So uh, in the future, uh, it's, it's a, it, it is an amazing subject, this, by looking at the um, deformability which is imprinted, we will learn about these beautiful stars, for which we know from the general relativity again, that they carry a mass uh, uh, that cannot exceed a limiting value. So you know that neutron stars exist only up to a maximum mass. This is a clear prediction of the Oppenheimer-Volkov equation. So a clear prediction of general relativity, which is telling us that even if you imagine to have more mass, more mass packed into a very small volume where matter is reaching nuclear densities or even above nuclear density, so above several 10 to the 14 gram per cubic centimeter, then the energy density content and the pressure themselves become source of gravity because GR is a nonlinear theory of gravity. And thus, gravity becomes a source, uh, the pressure is a source of gravity. And so, no. Uh, uh, 
a star with an arch surface can exist beyond a maximum mass, which depends on the equation of state, in other terms on the deformability of the star, in other terms on the content inside the core of the neutron star. And uh, this also historically has led to the conjecture that black holes had to exist if uh, massive stars couldn't uh, stop their collapse uh, just at the maximum mass. And uh, the, uh, before the discovery, the, the, the full future discovery, we knew that uh, uh, there are two families of neutron stars, the one that live in binary with a second neutron star, uh, for which the masses has been determined with extreme accuracy. And the mean mass of these double neutron stars is uh, uh, around 1.33 solar masses. And then there are the one that we call recycled because they increase their mass typically that have a mass of 1.49 solar masses because they accreted material. And uh, they change their spin, they change their magnetic field, and they change their mass. These are the so-called accretion powered recycled pulsar. Uh, that are especially this one, the recycled one, are the one used for performing the search of the stochastic background by the pulsar timing array. Forgive me for being so simple, but stellar evolution was telling then us that when you have very massive star, um, if the star is less than 20 solar masses, is exploding a supernova and it's leaving as relic a neutron star, but it is over massive, it can leave a black hole. But really we should know does the black hole really exist and how it forms? Uh, the stellar uh, black holes that were um, mass, uh, the measured masses uh, were consistent with the paradigm that since the maximum mass is below three solar masses, regardless uh, the, the equation of state from considerations of causality that any equation of state should be have an associated sound speed, which has to be less than the speed of light, we knew that uh, the black hole candidate were those X-ray sources housing an object that was heavier than three solar masses. And this was the masses that were are measured with large, large uncertainties. I skip this. So the discovery, the discovery was fantastic. Uh, because uh, uh, um, I was just checking the time, uh, because it was unexpected for several reasons. Well, it was unexpected because it was uh, quite loud. In, in fact, it was detected uh, from the birth, the alert uh, uh, system. And as Cliff uh, was mentioning in his uh, lecture, the signal, the raw signal, uh, was initially fitted with a wavelet, but um, since uh, uh, astrophysicists and relativists uh, were working uh, for decades in understanding the true waveform or the best waveform that could uh, general relativity predict uh, by matching a post-Newtonian physics, uh, uh, numerical relativity, a perturbation theory, it was immediately clear that Mm, it was possible through uh, the template uh, provided by general relativity, uh, discover that the signal was coming from two uh, uh, black holes and not two neutron stars that were merging. These uh, uh, was the energy that was emitted in gravitational waves, 3.6 times 10 to the 56 Earth per second, three solar masses were released. Uh, the full signal was seen, not only the spiral, but the merger and the ring down, also portion, though it was 
uh, be difficult to, to detect. And it was possible to infer through uh, Bayesian um, parameter estimation the masses of the components of this binary. And here I'm, I'm, short, I'm, I'm, I'm showing a very historical figure beside this one, uh, which is showing the posterior probability, uh, the posterior probability density function for the source frame component masses, because it was also possible to infer the luminosity uh, distance, which is contained in the signal, which is unique of binary systems. And thus, it was possible to say, to infer that the primary mass, the most massive object, had a mass with a typical, with a, of about 35 solar masses. And also the second object was having a mass of around 30. Far away, far heavier, than the, the known black holes that I was mentioning here. And that was a shock for astronomers, not for theorists, because uh, theorists were already um, predicting the existence of these that we call heavy stellar black holes. And, uh, but this was an amazing result. And the various lines and the color refer to the different waveforms that has been used to match filter uh, the signal, just to show how delicate and important it is to know uh, the waveform, the IMR phenom uh, is a phenomenologic, phenomenological waveform, which is comprising a spiral merger and ring down. EOB is coming from the effective one body theory that has been developed by Damour and Bonan. Um, uh, it was also amazing how it was possible to measure uh, the spin of the newly formed black hole and the mass of the newly formed black hole. 63 solar masses. So in a single source, in a single little wave, without being uh, able to disentangle the two polarization states, which cause the uncertainties we see, in any case, uh, we have learned a lot about these sources, this very first source. And also we learned about the luminosity and so the redshift, I don't remember exactly the, the redshift of the source, it was zero point something. Um, and also to look at the degeneracy there is with the inclination angle, it was likely to be a face of binary, but uh, it was also the proof consistent with general relativity that uh, these binaries are providing a measurement of the luminosity distance with degenerate with the uh, inclination angle. But in my view, it is a, a really a, a, a discovery that has to be considered as profound as it was the Galilean uh, discovery. So just because uh, sometimes we have the tendency of study, study, learn, do a lot of theories and forget to have a vision, to have to, to appreciate deeply, uh, molecularly, I would say, in, in your brain, how important was the discovery? Because if you, cons if you understand this, you then appreciate your future research. So this was the first detection of gravitational waves, direct and from a cosmic source. It was the most powerful astronomical event ever observed since the Big Bang, 10 to the 60 x per second. The first detection of two stellar origin black holes never known to exist before observed through in spiral merging and ring down. And let me tell you that when you subtract the signal, the residual are consistent with the noise. So the proof that to the present level, general relativity is, is consistent and it is consistent after the discovery of 73 sources, more. So uh, Einstein's theory of gravity in the dynamical storm 
uh, Fields regime was never tested, and this was the first time. Uh, Einstein theory on the generation of gravitational radiation is correct. In a sense, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, with this source, uh, we, we, we proved that the unimpeded propagation of gravitational wave across the universe, and um, it was the first measurement of the mass and the spin of a stellar black hole. And the astrophysical first identification of what we call heavy stellar black holes with unusual masses. Not to mention GW170817 in a, a lecture like uh, uh, this uh, would have been uh, an, in not honest. Uh, you all know this. So this is the first double neutron star binary merger that was discovered. And magically, it was also associated to a gamma ray flash. Here I have uh, the light curve in the three gamma ray satellite, Fermi in two energy band and integral, and the chirp, so the run of frequency versus time. While the signal of GW15 uh, or uh, of, of, of this signal was only lasting a fraction of a second, this was lasting longer because neutron stars are uh, uh, smaller. And so they are, uh, 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 and, are and are seen. Uh, and were only seen in the spiral phase because the merger is occurring at a higher frequency and uh, uh, for which uh, LIGO and Virgo were not sensitive. But it was the first time we could prove that a uh, gravitational wave appeared to uh, travel with the, speed of, with the speed of light. And these are uh, the uh, constraint on the deviation from the speed of light in one part uh, is to 10 to the minus 16. So again, a triumph of uh, general relativity. And the masses of the two neutron stars were consistent with the masses that we see in the double neutron star systems. Uh, but it was uh, uh, a revolution. Oh, well, I skip this. Uh, the, the shock uh, from an ast for an astrophysicist that I would like to discuss in the last uh, 10 minutes uh, is uh, that um, we uh, were expecting heavy stellar black holes because we know that uh, the mass of the star that are ending as black hole uh, is supposed or suspected to believe on the metallicity of the birth gas cloud. Let me give you a very uh, mm, uh, simple uh, argument. Uh, so you know that a star uh, comes uh, after the fragmentation of a massive uh, uh, gas cloud of a massive core in the interstellar medium. If you, and in order to make fragmentation and form stars, uh, 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 you need cooling. Cooling because the cooling of uh, uh, baryon through uh, the emission of radiation is uh, uh, producing, enforcing, guiding the collapse of lumps that are fated to become stars. And if you have zero metal, you have only hydrogen and helium cooling. And uh, the cooling function is this one, which is telling you that in order to baryons to cool, you have to produce molecular hydrogen and have very hot clouds of say uh, 1000 uh, Kelvin degrees or, or hundreds of Kelvin degrees. But if you add metals, uh, so nuclei, and atoms with all uh, electronic uh, levels and the uh, bound and bound and bound free transition, you uh, immensely uh, uh, enhance the cooling uh, from line emission and from continuum emission, from Remstrahlung emission 
if the, you have a plasma. So the cooling is affected uh, by the occurrence of metal. And I told you that in the primeval universe, there were no metal. And the metal enrichment is slowly, and it is occurring with time, with cosmic time, as soon as the first supernova are exploding. And uh, theory is telling if you have zero metallicity uh, gas cloud, you would expect that the family of the first stars would have a higher mass because the genes mass, which is the scale over which uh, uh, or the scale of the fragmentation is depending on the temperature. And if the gas is hot, it cannot cool efficiently, it can produce heavier star and so heavier relic black holes. So immediately after the discovery, there has been a burst of uh, uh, papers claiming that the first source of uh, uh, gravitational wave discovered was likely to be uh, mm, uh, a binary that was uh, uh, formed uh, in a low metallicity environment at a relatively high redshift. And uh, uh, this was a prediction made by Hager back in 2033 that was telling uh, this fact. So uh, here is metallicity, here is the mass of the uh, star initially on the zero age main sequence. And if you are at low metallicity, you form neutron star. If your stars are in the range between 10 and 25, you can form black hole uh, when through fallback. So you form a neutron star. The neutron star is driven above the maximum mass by fallback. And you form relatively light black hole. And then you form very massive black holes the one through direct collapse without even seeing any supernova. But there is also a clear prediction that is now being uh, uh, shaken that um, very massive stars and low metallicity star have a range in between 140 and 260 solar masses that instead of uh, leaving a relic, they explode in a hypernova. Uh, this is a called pair instability supernova because uh, these stars, um, when they are burning carbon oxygen in a very hot uh, uh, radiation uh, uh, fluid inside the core of a massive star, radiation is forming electron positron pairs that are reducing the pressure the core initially collapses. You enhance the carbon oxygen uh, burning to a such a rate that the star is exploding. So there is a so-called pair instability gap, well predicted by theory that we were willing to test, and claim that if there are very massive stars that form in low metallicity environment, because massive stars form preferentially in low metallicity places, we could have in principle black holes of 200 solar masses. Okay, so this is again a summary of the pair instability gap. So it's telling us that a black hole can form up to 40 solar masses, then no black hole, but Again, black hole of 200 solar masses and a gap, a lack of black holes. Uh, this is very important for all people that are studying the evolution of star, the late burning stages, uh, and um, it, uh, testing this theory is of paramount importance for astrophysics. The results of O3. Uh, that I can also discover tomorrow morning. Uh, O3 was the third run uh, that uh, uh, was carried on in, 19, uh, in 2019 and ended in March 29, 2020, with an improvement in the sensitivity both of LIGO and Virgo that enhanced their 
horizons to see more uh, more uh, uh, more events. Uh, as of today, uh, uh, we released a catalog with seventy three sources. So in uh, uh, the discovery occurred in, in 2015 and in 2020 from a few sources, now we have a population. So such an improvement in over five years of observation has no uh, comparison uh, in astrophysics uh, with other uh, major advances that uh, required decades of observation. So a major advance in a short time scale. So let me, uh, be before giving an overview that I will do tomorrow, let me just uh, uh, mention the discovery of outliers, the one that are uh, challenging our understanding. The first, uh, 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 outlier and that was very very famous was the discovery of this uh, 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 coalescence binary with a total mass of 3.3 so it was the observation of a distant cost and compact binary coalescence with the, the largest total mass recorded ever recorded before and uh, uh, the, the puzzle, the, the importance of this uh, uh, um, uh, source, which is GW, uh, sorry, I have to, GW190425, uh, is that this is the second, uh, uh, likely, the second uh, uh, neutron star discovered uh, by LIGO. And Virgo without a counterpart because uh, uh, the, the sky localization was uh, uh, very, very poor. And uh, uh, depending on the parameter estimation uh, you carry on, if you uh, have an ansatz on the spin of uh, the uh, coalescing uh, uh, objects, uh, you are in this case in the possibility in claiming that the most massive uh, uh, primary uh, is just above the maximum mass of a neutron star. So this for a moment was considered to be the first black hole neutron star candidate, first discovery in uh, no electromagnetic analog, but if you use reasonable values for the spin, it is likely to be uh, the second neutron star ever discovered. And uh, so together with uh, GW15 or 817, we have uh, um, uh, discovered as, as far as of today, two binary neutron stars. But when you look at the posterior distribution, you see that it is an outlier because it is the heaviest uh, system of two neutron stars ever discovered. And let me anticipate that um, there is the evidence that uh, we have to revise completely our understanding on the masses of the neutron stars that we believe were peaked very close to the Chandrasekhar mass limit. And now we have to revise the theory. The very important source, the, the third important source, was the discovery of a 23 solar mass black hole plus a 2.6 solar mass compact object. And uh, this is extremely important because it could be the lightest stellar black hole ever discovered or the heaviest neutron star ever discovered. Again, through the Bayesian parameter estimation, uh, we still have uncertainties in the masses, but of course, uh, this is a sort of, again, a, an outlier because uh, 
in the electromagnetic universe, we have seen a clear gap between neutron stars and stellar black hole. And we don't know whether there is a continuous mass spectrum related to how the supernova explosion and collapse is occurring. So this is the most unequal mass binary ever observed uh, so far. Uh, in the catalog, uh, we have two additional neutron star black hole coalescences that are extremely important. Uh, a black hole of 8.9 solar masses plus an heavy neutron star, another black hole and a relatively light neutron star. Uh, it is uh, extremely important because also these sources could be at the origin of short gamma ray bursts. So uh, uh, because the neutron star can be deformed uh, before being eaten by the black hole during the coalescence. And here I have made, made no time to, to, to discuss that, but the, the idea uh, again is that uh, mm, we are dealing uh, with, uh, with neutron star here and two is a neutron star that it is indeed far massive than the, uh, the neutron star we, we have seen before. And uh, uh, another very important source is this one. Uh, this is a black hole, black hole binary, which uh, has a mass ratio of 4.21. So it has a very large mass ratio. And one prediction of general relativity, here is the beauty full uh, plot of the waveforms seen in Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo. So this is a three detector uh, uh, um, signal. So it, it is uh, well traced back. It has a very high uh, signal to noise ratio. And thanks to this, it was possible to measure for the first time the contribution not to, uh, due to the quadrupole radiation, the L equal M equal two mode, but to measure for the first time the L the contribution at merger coming from the L equal M equal three mode, which is particularly uh, powerful so, so it has energy uh, when the mass ratio of the binary is relatively large. Again, a success of the theory of general relativity. So we are really measuring uh, the, uh, uh, improving the, the fact that the general relativity is telling us that the radiation is not only coming from the quadruple contribution, but also from the higher multiple moments for which there is a very well-developed theory. And I stop here because I, I want to talk tomorrow with a very big outlier uh, that is challenging and it is uh, the pair instability gap and it is an extremely good news for Einstein's telescope. So I stop here my lecture. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Professor Kolpi. Uh, uh, so we have about 10 minutes for uh, uh, questions. Uh, so participants, if you have any questions, you can. OK, so we have uh, some. So, uh, so uh, Sasha, ask away. Uh Okay, hi. Uh, thank you very much for a, for a very illuminating lecture. Uh, so my question is concerning this uh, mass gap uh, at the higher end. Uh, I was okay. wondering how certain are we about the edges of the gap? Are we sure that it's at 40 or is there some uncertainty there? And how sensitive is that edge to our knowledge of physics? Uh, so you anticipated what I was willing to say tomorrow. Uh, let me comment this uh, with this, uh, let me, or maybe with this one. So, um, 
so far uh, with a sizable number of, of uh, uh, binaries. The short answer is we see two peaks in the mass distribution of black hole at 10 and around 35, and the decline here consistent with the fact that there is a gap. But there has been the discovery of this system here where at least the primary is certainly in the gap. It, it is a black hole that should not have, should not be there according to the mass gap. Uh, in order to establish if, the, if there is a mass gap, you should, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, demonstrate that there are, uh, that there is an edge uh, around 40 and then a rise above 150, okay? But this is still impossible because uh, we do not have the sensibility uh, to, ha to, to detect uh, uh, the coalescence of 150 solar mass black holes plus 10, say, maybe in the next round. So, so the claim by the collaboration is that still there is no evidence, we lack of, we lack of uh, uh, data. But for sure, uh, it is challenged. So we, we have, we have an, uh, an outlier. And uh, there has been uh, suggestions that I would like to discuss tomorrow that the origin of this uh, black hole may not, may be related to multiple mergers. Uh, and uh, or it has mainly it is multiple merger is the only way or um, you need a very specific uh, um, evolution of the binary in order that the star doesn't develop a specific carbon oxygen core so it is there it is a challenge we will need to know more i see thank you very much Um, okay, uh, there is another question. Uh, Aditya, you are on for asking the question. There is a question by Aditya. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, my question was also regarding the disputed event, uh, uh, the outlier. So you said, uh, for example, the 3.3 solar mass merger. Uh, so, uh, does the tidal deformability not tell us about the nature of the object? So, uh, as far as I yes, as far as I know, it is uh, this uh, three. This let me just go to this first outlier. No, there is no, there is no. Um, uh, so the the SNR was too weak to have any evidence uh, of the tidal deformability, unfortunately. And was it also the case for uh, the asymmetric merger with the ma mass ratio of four is to one? Yes. No, okay. no, no. Uh, it's too. It's too early because uh, the deformability. You see the deformability just before the merger, and uh, it is very, very difficult to see it. Okay. Thanks. But it is a, it will be fantastic with Einstein time, but maybe also with the next run. Okay, uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, so besides uh, confirming GR and uh, uh, studying black holes, neutron stars and astrophysical sources, what are the other goals of LIGO? The, the other sources of LIGO? The other goals of LIGO besides mapping uh, black holes, neutron stars, and astrophysical sources, and testing GR. What, what, what can LIGO can do? What, what, uh, what else LIGO can do? What are the other near future goals of LIGO? Uh, probably, uh, so there is an ongoing, uh, um, there is an ongoing uh, study that uh, I might report tomorrow 
uh, on uh, uh, the non-detection of any uh, gravitational wave signal that can come from uh, the known pulsars in our galaxy. Uh, of course, uh, this, the, 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 this, this would be a sort of uh, next groundbreaking uh, uh, discovery, uh, and as I was also saying. Then uh, it's not clear. Uh, uh, we are expecting a supernova in the Milky Way, and this is again, uh, it would be super, super fantastic because we also have neutrino detectors and uh, but you know uh, you have to be far more even luckier than for gw gw 17 or 817 because you need uh, that uh, uh, your telescope should be on just at the time the supernova is is breaking and in reality the collapse is occurring one hour earlier so it would be uh, a fantastic. I, I don't have it here, but I, 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 I was planning to have. Uh, since uh, quite unexpectedly, nobody was uh, before, uh, before the first event, nobody was uh, thinking that there were an overwhelming number of events uh, of black hole, black hole binaries. And now it is important to understand the contribution from the most distant population, whether they form a background of unresolved sources. So maybe in the next run, uh, uh, we will be possible to set limits, so to, to discover this foreground or with Einstein telescope for sure, this will be very, very possible. And then uh, it is the unknown what we, we expect. Uh, let me say that Lisa that I will discuss on Sunday, on Saturday may uh, provide uh, uh, maybe uh, some, uh, some even more astonishing discovery because uh, we really don't know whether a 10 to the 6 uh, uh, or a 10 to the 5 uh, uh, compact object is a black hole or it could be a boson star or some exotic more object. So maybe we'll also discover by, by looking at the tidal deformability whether also neutron stars are different respect, with respect to what we, we are claiming. But apparently, so we will probably select the question of state. This, this is the, it is a very delicate issue, but, but we will be there. Yeah, I think uh, that's more than enough. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I think Aditya, you have another question? Yeah, it is building up on the uh, outlier events and the remarks you just ma made about exotic objects. So I just wanted to ask whether there are like since these are these are already outlier events, GW uh, nineteen oh four twenty. Those sort of events are already outlier. Whether they are respected uh, uh, exotic objects, I would not say accepted, but at least respected candidates for exotic objects for these events. Yeah, the GW nineteen oh four twenty five and no, other. no, I think it is uh, still. Let's say it, they are challenging uh, some of the uh, stellar physics, but they are not challenging uh, fundamental physics, I would say. Uh, so, so basically, these are either neutron stars or, bi uh, or black holes, you think that? Yes. Let me okay. say that un un until we will be measuring the deformability, it seems to be that uh, there is no uh, no deviations uh, uh, no deviations uh, not even on, the, on in, the, in the quadrupolar structure of a black hole uh, so it uh, seems that uh, 
we, we all we are willing to search for deviation from GR, but GR seems really uh, still a consistent. Uh, uh, so when and I, I will show tomorrow a few tests, but but it is really something. It is for the time being spectacularly uh, spectacularly. Uh, confirmed and uh, of course uh, the, the the masses uh, uh, it, it is interesting uh, especially when we will go uh, with Einstein telescope to deep deep into the into the universe uh, it's the only way you, we can learn about star formation at redshift uh, seven eight no because uh, we, we will only see galaxies, but we, we, we won't see stars. And so it is a way to learn about stars at cosmic, at cosmological distances. So this is, is, is really something that should, uh, should uh, impress you. Thank, thanks, Monica. Monica. Thanks for being so patient and coping with that stupid question. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Aditya. Uh, okay, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, okay, Professor Kalpi, I think uh, uh, those are all the questions that uh, we had. Um, I think we can close uh, the lecture for today uh, and we will again uh, uh, meet at 11.30 India time tomorrow, 7.30. See you tomorrow, okay. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye.